praise the Lord. Amen. Well, I want to uh, go in a new direction and uh, feel like the Lord is leading us down these, these roads. So if you've got your Bible, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 22. And we're going to read two verses of Scripture that are probably very familiar to you. Um, we call it one of the great GCs. If you've been around the church very long, there are two of them. One's the Great Commandment and one's the Great Commission, right? We've, we've kind of been around the church any length of time. You've probably heard that. So we're going to tackle the Great Commandment. And um, uh, this has become a verse that's very dear to my heart, uh, but over the years has continued to find new meaning in my way that I relate to Scripture and how I apply that to my life. And I want to take you on a journey uh, with this particular command. So Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now over in Mark's gospel, he adds the word strength. And uh, so I want to examine those four areas of our life, as well as loving our neighbor as ourselves over the course of the next five weeks. So now you know what's coming, right? Kind of. Uh, you never know what's coming from me. But, but Matthew, I, back in my college days, I heard a, uh, a pastor or a teacher, I don't remember, I don't recall who it was that influenced my thought process, but they said, you need to find a life verse. And um, uh, I thought, uh, this one came to my mind, but over the years I've come to realize there's other verses of Scripture, like Matthew or John chapter 21, verse 3, it says, I'm going out to fish. I thought that would be a great life verse. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I was reading, I'm preparing for our Wednesday night devotional, and I thought uh, the verse out of uh, Psalm 3 was... Uh, Lord, uh, break the jaw of my enemy and shatter his teeth. I thought, well, that's a good verse, sir. No, that's not a life verse. But uh, there are a lot of verses in Scripture you could probably pull out of context pretty easily. Uh, but this happens to be my life verse. I came, became attached to Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 and 39. It's interesting about uh, Scripture. This, is, this particular uh, verse uh, is... Uh, according to Matthew, uh, Jesus is claiming all the law and the prophets hang on this verse. All of it. In other words, uh, to love God completely and loving your neighbor as yourself, the rest of Scripture is a way to, to bring that to bear. How, do, how you apply that to, to it. These are the, the commandments that we are to build our lives on. To love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. If we get this right, we've got it right, right? All the law and the prophets hang on these two verses. They're, they're a way to unfold it. How do you do that? How do you, how do you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? How do you love your neighbor as yourself? And so these two verses, uh, I, need to, I really want to slow down over the course of the next five weeks, uh, counting today, and to begin to unpack that the way that I understand that and have experienced that in my life and to show you that. So I want to know how that, to, to figure out how that impacts the rest of my life. Now, I've got to tell you, you see a little diagram that I've created up there for you. That, uh, that's kind of colorful anyway. Um, but that's the way I'm going to unpack it and understand it. That's how I see it. Um, and so I want to kind of do that. I really I understand that you can't dissect an individual, your makeup, your being, into these areas. Uh, in fact, the Hebrews actually considered a whole. When they said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, they meant, we're trying to cover all the bases possible so we leave nothing untouched. To love God supremely, completely, wholeheartedly, just put it all in there. Jump in, jump in and test the water with both feet, kind of a thing. And so, uh, but I wanted to slow that down a little bit and begin a little investigation. And so I began to see myself as a, a four-dimensional being. Well, that makes no, make no sense at all, does it? Um, I'm three-dimensional to you, but, but we have four different things going on in our life, and I want to kind of slow that down a little bit. Consider 
tied to love God with all of our heart. Um, that's quite a high calling, isn't it? To love God with all of your heart. Do you realize how, how high that bar is? Uh, the scripture also tells me to love my wife uh, as Christ loved the church, and I'm still trying to figure that one out, right? After 30 years, I'm still working on that, and she helps me along. She lets me know if I'm not doing that right. Um, but to love God with all of my heart. How do you do that? How do I know I'm doing that? How do you do that? I do need to kind of give you a little uh, caveat here or some kind of a disclosure uh, about this particular graph. Um, kind of like a disclosure that you would get with medicine may cause uh, red eyes, dry mouth, swollen head. I don't know. Um, this is kind of this... This is not substantiated or endorsed by any kind of theologian or biblical scholar, but this is my, my way of trying to unpack this verse. Um, I, I know if you've read anything of Dallas Willard, he does some work in this area, and uh, so I've, kinda, I've gone a different direction. We kind of do it a little differently. But, uh, so as I read this passage, uh, the context tells me Jesus is trying to say, you need to figure out who has authority in your life, whether it's you or somebody else, and uh, you need to come to a decision on which direction you're going to go with your life. What, what are you going to hang your hat on, as we might, we might say in Emmett, right? Where are you going to hang your hat? And what, who reigns supreme in your life? What presses against your being day by day, moment by moment? What, what is giving you direction and purpose and pointing you in the right direction? What burns at the heart of your being? Now, I can tell you uh, that I can verbally tell you I may want to lose weight uh, and uh, exercise and uh, get fit, uh, but the fact of the matter is I'm not willing to do uh, curb my appetite or stay out of the snack drawer. Uh, I may not be motivated to get up in the morning and do my workout calisthenics and workout regimen. Um, so that really essentially tells me one thing. I really don't want to lose weight, and I really don't want to, work, I don't want to be fit. Isn't that true? I mean, I may say it, but if I'm really not willing to put my, all my eggs in one basket there, then I'm really, I, really I'm not telling you any, I'm, I'm basically lying to you. And so, so there's a fat chance that, well, fat chance, uh, that transformation happens right there. <coughs> See, there's a difference between wishing something and willing something to happen, right? So if, I, if I'm really serious about getting fit, then I'm going to do something about it. And so this is really coming down to loving God with all my heart. I can say I love God with all my heart, but if I'm not doing the things that are necessary to love God with all my heart, then I don't mean business. And what Jesus is trying to establish here is he's saying, I need, if you're really serious about loving God with all of your heart, then let's get down to business. Let's uh, sign on the dotted line for that new car. You know, I used to be a car salesman and be a preacher at the same time. That's almost like how do you don't oil and water. It doesn't quite work that way. But um, it's interesting. I'm, I'm fascinated by how a life is transformed over the last couple of years. It really has boggled my mind. Do you remember the, the man with the golden voice several years back that came on the news? He was a homeless guy. And uh, when people would stop, he would... He would do the radio announcing voice, and uh, uh, amazing. Overnight, he became a success, a big success story. But the sad fact was, a month later or so, um, he failed to change from the inside out and went back to his old ways. Uh, something happened there, and he, was, he failed to move forward in life and be transformed, and the result was personal destruction. So this, the, the area of the heart, when we talk about the heart, and by the way, in Scripture, you're going to find, uh, if we got theologians in the house, there's a lot of overlapping when they use terms like heart, soul, uh, uh, will, and, and those things. There's a lot of overlap. But as, it, as I've tried to isolate uh, the idea of the heart in Scripture, I've kind of narrowed it down to this idea that the heart and the spirit and the will are all one thing. That kind of that deals with this idea of volition. I am choosing to eat candy for breakfast. Anybody done that before? Oh, hey, praise the Lord. I've got, I've got a, somebody say, I do, by the way. No, I had two Fig Newtons this morning for breakfast. 
That's not candy. That's, what do they say on TV? It's, a cook, it's not even a cookie. It's, anyway, it's really good. Um, so to will something is to, to make action happen in my life. Um, if I really am going to get in shape, that means tomorrow morning when I get up, I'm going to, I'm going to eat my oatmeal. I'm probably going to get up and do my little uh, workout routine and try to stay in shape. Uh, my wife will love me just the same, but I'm going to try to get in shape. Um, so I have, I have the power of choice. When you will something, you have the power of choice to make a decision that you will do this. And, and, and so you make that decision and try to go down that, that road. And over the course of the next few weeks, I'm going to show you why sometimes that fails. But when you begin, you have to start have a starting point somewhere. Um, June 1st, 1980... I made a decision that I was going to follow God for the rest of my life. Now, have I, have I lived up to that decision? No. But have I, have I, I decided to rebel and go against the different? I haven't. I have willed that to happen in my life. And over the course of time, God has refined that and, and transformed the person that I was who shook his fist at God and said, I'll, have, I'll not have a part of you in my life. To a guy who loves God, to the best of my knowledge, as completely as I know how to say, what a cool place to be. <clears throat> to love God with all of my heart. I got up this morning, like I try to do every morning, and I was yielding myself to God as completely as I know how. God, here I am. I love you. I wish I could tell you what love, well, you know what it is. To love God completely with all your heart. What a place of freedom, what a place of relaxation, and to know that he loves me with an unconditional love. It's not just an emotion, uh, but it's this determination that this will be the direction of my life, to love him completely with all of my heart. Our heart, our, our will, our spirit, that's the first step in making this, decis this decision that my life will be transformed, to love him completely with all my heart. And, and so you have to make a decision this morning. I'm going to force you to make a decision to love him or not. I don't know that you can love him partly. If I, if I told my wife that I love you 99.9%, .9 she'd go, well, what about that 1.01%? You have to come to a place where you love him completely. See, I can set my heart on God and his kingdom, and when I do that, my life will begin to spill in that direction. Um, I can choose to love God and others, I can choose to eat candy or watch TV and watch TV, or I can eat a salad and exercise. That'll be a hard choice, by the way, when I go home, because we do have candy and I have a TV, so I don't know that salad's made. Um, if, you're, if you're really satisfied where you are in your journey with Christ, then keep on doing what you're doing. But if you're tired of the up and down, in and out experience with God, or the apathy that happens in your relationship with God, or the inconsistency, then I'm going to ask you this morning to say, you know what, I'm all in on this. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say, I'm going to set my heart and my life on God completely. Loving Him completely. Getting, getting in there and, and, and uh, going for it all the way. I believe that if we do that, God will give to us the abundant life that He has promised we will begin to experience a renewal and revival in our life that is transformative, that will change us completely. I know, I've experienced it, and I know that some of you have too. To love God with all of your heart. The heart deals with this idea of priority. What consumes your thoughts, your, 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 your life? What consumes your energy, your focus? Um, what consumes the bulk of my time, my talent, my treasure, my touch? That really is a litmus test on what you, what you have set your life on. God is pouring into our hearts, even in these moments, all that we have to, to be able to respond to, to him in that measure. Um, if, if things are going to happen, uh, then we need to jump on with that. i got to tell you, let me give you an illustration of this. Uh, back in 1980, I dated a pretty little college girl. And uh, I decided after our first date that that was the one I was going to marry. Now, I have to let you know that prior to that, that was actually in the fall. 
of my uh, senior year at Mid-American Nazarene College. But in the springtime, I had a professor came to our class, and he basically preached a lesson to us. He said, you need to know three things in life. And I'm not sure if it was even biblical, but it sounded pretty good at the time. He said, you need to know who your master is. You need to know what your mission is. And you need to understand if you're going to have a mate or not. And I had the two first two figured out. I knew I was going to be a preacher. And uh, I knew he was my master. But I didn't know who my mate was. And I was, you know, I'm a senior. I'm going to graduate. And I think, I haven't got my mate picked out. You're going to get there. Uh, but uh, So I'm, I'm going down that road. And uh, so I, uh, I actually took a whole month. And, and through that whole month, I would take times of fasting and of praying. I'm seeking God. I'm saying, God, I don't want to miss your perfect will. And, and I was going through that whole process. And so once, once we got started in college week, or, or the first couple of weeks of college, it was called twerp week. I don't even know if they even still do twerp week. Uh, but twerp week is when the girls ask the guys out. And uh, so um, I was a very shy individual uh, around girls. Still am around people. Not girls, I don't mean that like that, dear. Uh, but <clears throat> so uh, I, was, uh, they, I started getting these dates. And I was pretty excited. I thought, wow, this is great. I have a selection. It's the buff. <laughs> it's a buffet. <laughs> so... so after about the fifth date, she hadn't asked me, and I didn't even know her. And uh, I mean, I, we dated in the spring, so I really, but uh, uh, so after the fifth date, I decided, you know, this ain't working out too well. I mean, it was great, okay, but uh, it, it wasn't like we had, a, uh, uh, had taken her to uh, Andrus Blackwood and Company's concert back in the spring. And so... I decided to go and ask Nancy for a date during twerp week, which is countercultural, and uh, I did it. And uh, we went out on the date, and uh, that night I knew in my heart that that was the one I was going to marry. So the early next morning at seven o'clock, I got up and uh, went to her apartment, knocked on her door. Her sister came to the door, and I said, "Karen, can I see Nancy?" And so yeah, so she come out, and her hair was beautiful, and teeth were shiny. And uh, so I told her, uh, you're the one that I'm going to marry. <laughs> that didn't work out very well. <laughs> In fact, we continued to date, and uh, I would say things like, I love you. She goes, you don't even know me. And uh, so she had me saying, instead of I love you, say olive juice. That I love you. Anyway. We worked through that process. But I finally got her to cave in after three months. And, uh, and now 30 years later. It's interesting. I was so caught up. Um, I mean, I, I was, I was uh, through that process of uh, dating and getting engaged and then getting married. I, I remember going through my senior year. My grades suffered. Um, I was getting a little sleep because I had to work. I worked at the campus center. And uh, through that whole pro process, there was one thing on my heart. Nancy. Well, yeah, Nancy. I did, I did think about food a lot back then, too, but Nancy was on my heart. And uh, my whole life was built around loving her completely. And... Uh, Ever since then, since we've been married, that hasn't stopped. And, and to completely do that day by day, week by week, month by month, during the good and the bad, it has continued to build. I love her more today. This is something I wrote back in. I, I love you more today than I did yesterday and less than tomorrow. God, I love you with all of my heart. I know that's not where I, I'm doing the best I can at the moment, and I know tomorrow I will love you even more. God, I love you with all my heart. You are the focus of my life. Love, it's, it's kind of a, it's an interesting term. We toss it around um, uh, in our, our vocabulary a lot in these days. But I think Kierkegaard once said, he said, purity of heart is to love God, uh, to, is, is to will one thing in your life. 
and to, to love God in such a way that, like the Apostle Paul, it's one thing I do. I forget the past, uh, what is behind. I press a hold of, what, of, of Christ who has taken hold of me. It's this one thing. Uh, when Jesus was going and doing ministry through, through Galilee, and he, and he came upon uh, a crowd of people, and it said that when he looked upon them, he was moved with compassion. That word love, agape, that we, we heard about, he was moved with such compassion that it, uh, the word heart in the Greek language means bowels, that your stomach gets in a knot. It just grips you so much. You ever been there about something? It just grips you, and you can't think about anything else. And it says that that's, that's the kind of thing that we love God so much that it, it's intense. We, we love Him with all of our heart. And when we do that, the rest of our life will fall into this direction that we just decide to go. That's the only way to do Christianity, amen? Is to love God completely with all of our heart. And as we do so, the rest of life will begin to fall in place. There's a great little book by Brother Lawrence called The Practice of the Presence of God. I was reading it one time uh, while I was deer hunting. I forgot all about deer hunting. And on a hillside over in the Atlanta area, tears began to flow because I realized in my life where this man was describing his love for God and how he was so consumed by God, I wasn't there. So that even when he was washing dishes in the sink, his heart rejoiced in the presence of knowing Almighty God. And I wanted that so for my life and began to incorporate that, cultivate that kind of awareness into my life. Practicing love creates those, those, uh, everything else in my life to that particular direction. Um, the idea that loving God with all of my heart, there's a phrase out there, a saying out there that says, as goes the king, so goes his kingdom. As goes the heart, so goes your life. Wherever you set your heart, wherever you will to have, where, wherever you make a decision and will your life to go, that's where you're going to go. If, you're, if you don't set your heart completely on God, then I'm afraid it's going to be hard to stay focused and living out the Christian life that God has called us. To live holy, to live in a life of that is, is expressing love. The proverb writer writes, guard your heart because from it flows everything in life. Whatever captures your heart consumes your life. It's important that we take this step this morning to say, God, that song is so, so fitting this morning. I surrender all. I know that when I do that, there's going to be more times that I'm going to need to yield my life to you. But in this moment, everything that I am, I yield to you. Because you love me with a, a love that I can't begin to comprehend. And I want to respond back to you in a love like that. The pursuit, this direction of deciding to daily love God like I daily love my wife creates room for growth and feelings and, and uh, the, the wonderful things that happen in that kind of a love relationship. Being a believer is not for the weak-willed. It's for somebody who, who says, I'm, gonna, I'm going to set my direction upon God, abandon myself to Him. Christianity isn't a lot of doing. It's what I am, yielded, resting completely in God. My dad, used to, he's not a word, uh, man of many words, kind of a quiet guy. So you know I got my loud mouth from my mother. So I'm just kidding. Mom, I hope she ain't watching. Um, but my dad would say things like, uh, during the middle of winter, us boys, uh, we didn't care about the electric bill. And so we'd go out the, door, out the door and leave the door open. And my dad would say things, in or out, I'm not trying to thaw winter out. <clears throat> and I would think in moments like these, in or out, in or out, do you want in or out? Do you, do you really want to uh, experience the life of God in the measure that he wants you to experience it in? Then jump in. This is, this is the moment. This is the time to make a decision and say, I'm completely in. I'm all in on this one. I'm taking, instead of diversifying, like we diversify our money and, and things and investments, uh, it's all in one basket here. We're, we're putting it all in here. I'm going for it. I'm going for broke. I, I'm believing this, this is the, the real thing, and I'm going to jump in with both feet, and this is, this is it. And when I do so, 
we begin to experience God in a measure that we can't experience in any other way. When we do this, God begins to, to blossom in our lives and in, our, and in the way that we live. It's go time. When I was a second grader, we lived in a place called Herman, Missouri. It's a good old German town. And I remember as a second grader, my mom, I wanted to play Little League Baseball. My mom took me down to the city park where the coach and the, the Little League players were gathering. I still remember it as if it were yesterday. Uh, we pulled up in our 63 uh, Mercury station wagon with the wood panels on the side and beautiful cars. Uh, but anyway, uh, we had that thing for years and years. I was almost embarrassed to ride in it. But, uh, <clears throat> and then he bought another one after that. But, uh, <clears throat> so my, I remember mom pulling up with us three boys in the car. And um, she's, uh, I got out of the car, uh, assuming that everybody was going to pile out of the car. And uh, down the, the slope was the ball field. And I saw out in there at the pitcher's mound was a, a tall man and a bunch of little leaguers, uh, little guys like my age, wanting to play ball. And I got out of the car and closed the door and turned around and was waiting for my mother to come out with me to go down and talk, talk to the coach. And I looked at her, and she was sitting in the car. So I walked over to the window and said, uh, uh, I thought we were going to go sign up for baseball. And she says, you're going to go down there, and you're going to ask the man if you can play baseball. And um, I began to fear. You talk about fear. I, you, would, you would have thought that I was asking for a million dollars. But I, uh, I would, the fear struck me in such a way that it gripped me and paralyzed me. And... And then my mom yelled out the window, go down there if you want to play baseball. If you really want to do this, you need to step up to the plate and go ask. And uh, so I made my way down to the bottom of the hill. I can remember this, walking all the way down to the bottom of the hill onto the playing field. I could see the, the, the coach looking back at me, watching me. All the little players turned around looking at me. Talk about the center of attention. I thought the whole universe was watching me at that moment. And in that moment, I said, okay, um, I'm not sure you will let me play. I'm kind of a scrawny kid. Um, and I decided in that moment, I don't have enough guts to ask the man to play baseball. So I turned around, walked back up to the car, and my mom said, if, if you're not going to ask, you're not going to play. I said, I guess I'm not going to play. I got in the car, and I never played baseball. I mean, I played with my brothers, but I never played on a team. I wonder if in a place like this, if we might be somewhere in that place, we're on that hill, and we say, okay, I don't know. That's a big leap. To love God completely? What if he asked me to do this, or asked me to stop doing that? Will you do that? Well, maybe. But I can tell you from experience that if you're willing to say, okay, I'm all in. I don't know where this trail is going to go, but if I'm willing to say I'm all in, I'll guarantee you, you'll not regret a, a bit of that, that journey. God has been more than faithful to me. I do not deserve the life that I live. I do not deserve the presence of God in my life. And yet he asked me, Come, love me with all your heart, and I will give to you my life, his abundant life, to walk in his presence, to experience his joy, to transform your life into something that you cannot do on your own. I want us to stand and I want us to close in a word of prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for moments like these. We thank you for scripture like this that calls to our attention the, the seriousness of this call. We don't want to play around with jumping in and falling away. We don't want an experience with you that's up and down and cold and hot and in and out. God, we want to experience the fervent, hot life of God dwelling within our, our lives 
And the only way to experience that is if we say, okay, in this moment, I'm going to make a decision to follow you with all of my heart. I'm going to place myself completely in your care. And I know I'll have to make a lot of decisions subsequent to this daily to love you. And as I do that, oh God, you will make my life something that I cannot. And I know in a place like this, with a group like this, oh God, our hearts are being stirred toward you once again. For some of us, we we probably just lived a life of mediocrity. We backed away. We, for whatever reason, we found our play ourselves away from your presence. And in these moments, oh God, we once again say to you, "Here I am. I'm going to stake my life on you." And I pray, oh God, that you will honor those prayers of our heart. Bless us with your presence. Fill our lives with your presence once again. Lead us in direction, although unknown, it is certain that you are in control. Help us, I pray, to walk in faithfulness to you. Remind us, O God, daily of our commitment to you. And may we continue to cultivate the relationship that we have with you. We do love you. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen.